Hi everyone. So today we are going to be taking a look at 10 super fussy house plants. And I mean, these plants are some of the most finicky plants out there. They are difficult. I would even consider calling them bad for beginners. And I have a very specific set of criteria as to why all these plants are so super fussy and difficult. And the first on that list is actually around watering. All of these plants are so super particular about watering. And I mean, you may go like five minutes past when it wanted to be watered, but it's gonna act like you went five days past when it wanted to be watered. That's how ultra fussy and finicky these plants can be. Number two on my list revolves around humidity. All of these plants just really want higher humidity and they do weird things when you don't give it to them. And I'll explain more about what kind of things I mean as we go through the plants today. And next on the list is lighting. These plants are the type of plants where you might be lucky to find one spot in your home where they will be happy. And if you ever move them out of that spot, they are gonna throw a temper tantrum. That's how picky they can be about lighting. And I will tell you what kind of lighting, exact lighting each of them prefers as we go along today. But the last thing that makes these plants so fussy and so difficult, and it applies to the majority of the plants we're gonna be looking at today, is that they tend to send out signals that something is awry, something's wrong. They're not happy. A yellow leaf, some brown crispy leaf tips, whatever it may be, but the problem is the things that they send out signal wise to you, there's like multiple reasons that that could happen on that plant. And the plant gives you no other indication of exactly which one of those reasons it is. So then you're left guessing, trying to troubleshoot, trying to solve the problem. And when you don't know exactly what caused it, sometimes what you do to try to solve it could make it worse. But let's go ahead and let's get into these plants. And I do want to say you guys that I own a lot of these plants, the majority of the plants on the list today. And I have been able to figure them out with the exception of one, and we'll get to that one at the end of the video. But you can master these plants. But once again, they are just really, really fussy. And so just be prepared. Be prepared if you're gonna buy one of these plants. But the first plant I think we're gonna take a look at today, and honestly, this one has not been that difficult for me to get the hang of, but everybody else I know who has owned one has struggled with it. And that is what is scientifically known as the Athalandra squarosa, or more commonly known as the zebra plant. Now I do own a big one of these. You saw it recently, I think in my summer plant growth update video, but it's so big, it's hard to get out here on screen. So I did bring out my little baby one today and I'm kind of glad I did because I did go a little bit too long between watering for its liking and it is throwing out one of those weird signs that it's not happy. So I'll be able to show you that in person today. But this is my little baby, Athalandra squarosa, called a zebra plant because of those nice white stripes on those beautiful green leaves. And like I said, this one is just a little baby one, but it is actually doing really well for me this summer. It's been putting out a lot of new growth, but it occasionally gets a little mad at me. And that is why we have the brown crispy leaf situation going on here, as you can see. And basically this goes back to what I was talking about regarding, first of all, watering. So this plant hates to dry out. Like in the slightest, it does not like to dry out. It is just wants to be moist, but not too wet because it can potentially get root rot. Although I find it's probably pretty difficult with this plant because of how much water it really wants. But the second the top of the soil starts to look even remotely dry, I need to go in and water this plant. If I don't, I start to get these brown crispy leaf tips. Sometimes it'll be a little bit of a pale yellow behind that as well. And then it'll drop the leaf. It just drops it, just throws it off at you. You're gonna find it on the floor one day. I think I even have a picture I might be able to flash up here for you of the last time that happened for me. But the funny thing is, if you water it even remotely too soon, it will do the exact same thing, exact same thing. And I'm telling you, it is like, you can't even go a full day early on watering it or a full day late on watering it because that is what will happen and it will pop leaves off at you. So lots of times people who own these plants, you'll see them and they'll just be like a long bare stem with just a few leaves up top because that's what keeps happening. Now, another thing with this plant, it wants a lot, a lot, a lot of bright, bright light. Now I have seen things out on the internet saying that this plant doesn't like bright light, that it doesn't like direct light. BS, I call BS on that because the more bright light that I put these plants in, the better they perform. And they actually get a pretty decent amount of direct light for part of the day where I have them and they're fine with that. They love it. They don't get leaf burn. 
you know, once again, everybody's home's a little different. Windows are different. You know, acclimate your plant. If you see signs of like leaf burn, pull it back. But these plants want a lot, a lot, a lot of light. Now, along those same lines, this plant wants a lot, a lot of humidity. I mean, I think it would probably be most happy in like somewhere around like 80 to 90% humidity. Now, I don't have that in my house. And in the winter, I do give my little Aphalandra squarosas their own personal humidifiers so that they are happy throughout the winter. But in the summer, we've been doing fine. My humidity has been ranging between like 42 and 55, I think. And I don't have humidifiers going for them right now. But part of the reason I think they're okay with that is because I'm getting all of the other conditions that they like right. If I wasn't getting those other conditions right, they'd probably be even more unhappy and less tolerant of my lower humidity. But if you definitely wanna keep them super duper happy, that higher humidity is gonna help. But also, once again, with higher humidity becomes other problems such as fungal infections, bacterial infections. So you really gotta make sure if you are providing that level of humidity for any of your plants that you've got proper air circulation. Otherwise, you're gonna start seeing like black spots, gray spots on the leaves. And once again, you're gonna be like, what are you trying to tell me what is wrong with you? So always make sure when you have super high humidity, you've got some kind of air circulation going on. So that there's not just constant moisture sitting on that plant. But let me set this guy back aside and we are gonna move on to another plant who behaves very similarly. To this one. So the next plant that we're going to look at is actually the Pilea cadirii, which is more commonly known as the aluminum plant. I do own one of these, but he has gotten quite large and it was getting hard to kind of get him on frame here. So I am just going to flash up a picture of him. But I do want to point out that Pileas just in general tend to be a little bit fussy and finicky, but I find this one to be more fussy and finicky than, for example, my Pilea glauca, which is my vining Pilea that I own. But these two do actually do some of the same things. I I just find the Pilea glauca to be a little bit less fussy and finicky. But this aluminum plant, basically it will do the same thing that that Athelander squarosa does if you go even slightly too long between waterings or if you water it slightly too soon. These two plants really have the exact same kind of watering requirements. They want that soil constantly moist, but not too wet. This one I feel like is even less tolerant of like if you get that soil too, too wet, like it's more prone to root rot than the Athelander squarosa. But once again, you're gonna go like, you're gonna feel like it's five minutes past, you know, too long waiting to water and the plant's gonna act like you left for a week and it needed to be watered the day you left. And it drops leaves so much more quickly than the Athelander squarosa. Now it does have more leaves and they're smaller. So I guess, you know, it's not really apples to apples, but the leaves do the exact same thing. They'll start to get brown and crispy. It'll spread up the leaf and then you'll pick up the plant to go water it and leaves will just fall off all over the place. And honestly, my Pilea glauca, it drops leaves like that too if I go slightly too long without watering it. But they don't really get super brown or crispy and it doesn't drop nearly as many. So that's why I'm saying I feel like that one's a little bit less fussy and a little bit less finicky. Now, when it comes to lighting for the aluminum plant, it's a little bit more tolerant of a range of lighting but it doesn't seem to enjoy direct light like the Aphalandra squarosa does to an extent. I find the Pilea really wants that indirect bright light and then it really does want super high humidity and I don't know, I have had a humidifier by it, <laughs> I have tried all kinds of things and I don't really think the humidity level is making a difference in my house for it. I can't quite figure it out. I think it's really a combination of the lighting and getting the watering right for me in my level of humidity. That is what I think is the issue when I get those brown crispy leaf tips. But both of these plants have kept growing for me. They're putting out new leaves constantly. So as long as I'm not losing like a ton of the old leaves at once to where the plant starts to look bald, I'm kind of okay with it. But other people who don't have like as high of a humidity naturally where they live and things, you're probably going to see more of your leaf loss related to low humidity than I am personally where I live. Now, the good news is that other than the weird like browning of the leaf and those falling off, this plant doesn't throw out as many other weird signs. Like there's no other weird leaf things that this plant does that can be confusing. So at least that's good. At least that narrows you down a little bit to it's either the lighting the watering or the humidity. But once again, if you do increase the humidity for these plants and you're getting it up towards that like 80%, 90% mark, just once again, make sure you've got good airflow so that then you aren't seeing other kinds of weird like fungal type issues or anything going on. But let's move on to our next plant. And this is actually an entire group of plants because I feel like they all kind of have similar 
issues and are picky about the same types of things. And I didn't really feel like there was one I could really like single out more than the rest. So that is alocasia. And alocasia can be very, very tricky, especially for beginners. But I will tell you, once you figure them out, it's easier, it really is, but it might take you a while to get there. And lots of times you'll hear people talking about how they're in the two leaf club with their alocasias, meaning they can only ever seem to maintain a total of two leaves on the plant at any given time. That's what I mean about them being fussy and finicky and super picky because they are just so particular about things and when they get unhappy about them, they tend to drop leaves. And that's how you end up in that, I only ever have two leaf club. But what you need to get right for these plants that I think a lot of people don't realize, number one, is that they want way more light than you actually think they do. Now, I do have an alocasia care video and I will link that in the description down below for you. And I talk in that video about how I have some growing outside in North Texas and we've had triple digit heat all summer long. They're on the south side of my house. They're in direct light all day, hot light all day, and they're doing fine. So there is no reason to think that you can't put your indoor alocasias in a super bright location like a southern facing window. But once again, all of our situations are different. So just keep an eye on it and pull them back a bit if you need to. But if you get the lighting right, I find that you're less likely to lose leaves as long as you're also getting the watering right. Because they're pretty picky about their watering too. They like to be kept more on the moist side but once again, you go a little bit too moist, these plants get super upset, super fast. They are super prone to root rot. And if you water them too soon and you water them at night, you will often wake up to a wet, mushy leaf on your alocasia. And that is something that is caused by a little scientific phenomenon known as guttation. Weird word, I know. But basically your plant is saying, you gave me too much water and now I gotta expel it somehow. And it expels it through its leaves and then the leaves get messed up. So I did bring out my Alocasia cupria to show you today. And also you guys, if you don't have like bright enough light coming from the top, they like to stretch out to reach the light. And there are things you can do to kind of tame this, you know, kind of get them more upright, but I'll cover that in a different video. But we are getting another new leaf. We did just recently get this beautiful new leaf here. And now, as you can see right here, we're getting another new one coming in. So I'm super excited about it. So if you do get the conditions right, this is what happens. And it's only been about, I think, less than two weeks since I got this leaf. And then this one's about to unfurl. So this is how you get out of the two leaf club if you're in the two leaf club, that bright, bright light. So this is directly in a Southern facing window in my home. Quick reminder, I am in the Northern hemisphere. And I also have this in some super well draining soil, which is a must because like I said, they are super prone to root rot, but I make sure that I keep this soil relatively moist. I pretty much only let it dry about halfway out. So no matter what size your pot is, let it get about halfway out before you water it. And at all costs, try not to water it at night. Try to water it first thing in the morning so that it can use up some of that water before that following evening so that you are less likely to have that guttation problem. Now, I did recently kind of mess that up myself and I did get a little bit of guttation happening on this leaf over here. And so once it gets a little wet and mushy, once it kind of dries, this is kind of what you're looking at. And if you can tell, it looks like there's almost like a water ring on it. And that's because it got wet. It was just expelling water because I watered it too late in the day. It probably might've been a day too early to water it, but I was going out of town and so I just did it. <laughs> but it will happen like that. And then, you know, that leaf doesn't look perfect, but I'm not gonna cut it off, it's not that bad. But another thing is that alocasias have a tendency to drop leaves for many reasons, but also just when a new leaf comes in, they will sometimes drop their oldest leaf. Now, if that oldest leaf is super old, don't worry about it, old leaves die. But if that's like a leaf that came in three weeks ago and it's dropping, that's when you know like something's off with the lighting or something. That is their way of saying, I'm not happy, I'm gonna be fussy and you need to fix what you're doing. But old leaves will just eventually die off. So you can see here, because that new leaf is coming in, this one is dying off. This one is one of the original leaves that was on this plant when I bought it back in January. We're in end of August right now. So this is just natural leaf loss. I'm not worried about it. But another thing with alocasia that they are so weird about is when they get flowers. It's so funny. They will prioritize flowers over anything else. 
And if you don't remove that flower when it comes in right away, you'll lose a lot of your older leaves. So I highly recommend removing alocasia flowers the second they come in. Don't let them linger. Now, when it comes to humidity, they do prefer slightly higher humidity. I find that they are less finicky about how high the humidity is than the first two plants we talked about. I feel like as long as you're at 50% or higher, they're usually okay as long as you're getting all those other care requirements we've talked about so far right. But I'm not gonna lie, you guys, they can be difficult to figure out. And yeah, I feel for you people who are in the two leaf club, but just kind of take some of this advice I've given you today and see if you can't get out of that club. And once you figure it out, you'll be out of that club for good. But I'm gonna set this guy back aside. So the next plant I wanna talk about on our list are Fitonia. And this is more commonly referred to as the nerve plant. And these plants are super beautiful, you guys. I mean, the little fine lines of the veining and how the colors look against the leaves and they come in different color combinations and they are gorgeous and they are relatively small compact plants. They are just a great plant that people see and are like, yeah, this is cute and it's small. It's not gonna take up a ton of space. I'm gonna bring this into my home and then it's gonna get super picky, super finicky, super fussy and lots of times it's just gonna die. But if you don't want it to die, here's what it wants, or at least what I think it wants, because I don't know. Sometimes this one is a little bit harder to read than others. But once again, it wants more moist soil, probably closer to what I was talking about with the Aphelandra squarosa and the Pilea versus the Alocasia. This one really wants you to water it when that first top layer of soil actually gets dry. Now, as far as lighting goes, this plant is not really a fan of direct light, but it still wants a lot of light. And that's where a lot of the plants on this list today are problematic, is they want as much intense light as you can give them, but they don't want a single drop of that bright direct light, with the exception of the Aphelandra squarosa and the Alocasia. Like I said, I feel like they can tolerate that direct light a little more, but a lot of these other ones, and especially the Fetonia, mm -mm, they ain't gonna be happy. Ain't gonna happen. They're gonna be like, nope, burn my leaf, drop my leaf, droop, be sad, whatever it may be. And while we're on the topic of drooping, that is what this plant likes to do, regardless of what it's unhappy about. And that's difficult because you don't know. It could droop because you overwatered it. It could droop because you've underwatered it. It could droop because the humidity is not high enough. It could droop because it doesn't like the level of light you've put it in. So good luck figuring out why it's drooping. But use your best judgment. If you know you just watered it yesterday and you know that it was a little bit dry on the top, then odds are it's not drooping because you overwatered it, right? So maybe take a look at the lighting situation, take a look at the humidity because this one also wants super high humidity. So we're talking way up there, probably at least 60% or higher. But once again, you gotta be careful with airflow, especially on this one, it has much finer leaves and those finer, thinner leaves I find are more prone to mold issues and fungal issues if your humidity is high and you don't have enough airflow. Now, another thing about the Fetonia is that it is super sensitive to temperature changes. It does not like to be too cold. It doesn't really like it if there's a shift in temperatures, even if it's like, you know, you had 75 in your house and you drop it to 60, it'd be fine with 60 probably, not for too long of a time, but it really doesn't appreciate when you take it from that high to that low. So for example, if you drop your thermostat at night when you sleep, be a little bit careful and especially keep this one way far away from any air conditioning or heating vents because it does not like it. Once again, it will probably start to droop on you. And if it droops too many times on you, you guys, it's like, it'll bounce back for a bit, but then after you do anything that causes it to droop more than like a dozen times, say maybe even less than that, it will droop and die and just not come back. So once again, a super fussy, super finicky house plant. But if you can get those conditions it wants just right, you can keep it alive and happy and thriving. So the next plant on our list, and this one is a little bit tricky for me. I really didn't want to put it on here because I have never found this particular genus of plants to be that difficult. However, I do recognize that probably the majority of the world, aside from me, actually do find them to be quite difficult. And I will say that in the ones that I personally own, there are some that are more finicky and fussy than others. And that is the genus Calathea, now actually been reclassified as Gopersia. But once again, I have not had a huge struggle with my Calatheas 
But there is one, like I said, I'm looking at it, that's a little bit more finicky and fussy than the rest. And I have heard from other people that they have had the same experience with this one. So I am bringing this one out to talk about today. And that is the Calathea ornata, otherwise known as the pinstripe Calathea. And if you can take a look at that leaf right there, this is kind of why people think Calathea in general are fussy and why this plant is fussy. Because this crisping, this is totally crispy by the way, this crisping and yellowing can happen for any number of reasons. It can be because you went too long without watering it, or it can be because it thinks it's not high enough humidity in your house, or it could be because it's getting too bright of light, even if it's not direct light. So these plants are super particular about lighting. And once again, there's like most of my Calathea, I find one spot in my house they like, and that's where they stay. They stay there. I don't really try to move them because they tend to throw a fit if you do. But this one has been a little bit more problematic, like I said, for me than the rest of mine. It definitely wants a more well-draining soil. I did recently repot it up into my forest floor mix from like my, my basic mix. All my other Calathea have done fine in my basic mix, but this one, since I moved it into the forest floor mix, has been putting out all of this new growth. So I'm not sure if you can see down here, but all of these are new leaves that have come in down here at the bottom and it is pushing out even more. I can see two more new ones coming in down there already, but it is sacrificing some of its older leaves now as those leaves are coming in. And I think that's honestly what's happening here. I don't think this is related to it's super mad about any one particular thing. I actually think it's just sacrificing these now that I've done something that made it want to push out all of this new growth. But I guarantee you, as soon as we move into fall and winter and the humidity drops in this house and the sun starts tracking in a different direction, this plant's gonna get all upset again and I'm probably gonna start to see this again. I will say that I think this one appreciates slightly higher humidity, but then again, I don't even know if I can tell you that, you guys, because last winter I set it on top of a humidifier and it did nothing to change the situation. So good luck with this one. I definitely wouldn't recommend this as the Calathea for a beginner. I do also have a Calathea video where I talk about kind of the easiest to hardest. So if you are looking for kind of the easier Calatheas, I will also link that down below in the description for you. But as far as this leaf weirdness goes, the other thing about this is, you know, Calatheas, if you water with water that is like crappy tap water, like my city has pretty crappy tap water, so I don't use tap water, but if you do, it can deposit minerals into the edges and tips of the leaves and it can cause them to be crispy like this. Humidity can cause this. In my experience, it's usually not humidity that causes this. Not getting the watering right can cause this. Freaking light problems can cause this. So many things can cause this. And with Calathea in general, I find it's a little bit harder to troubleshoot. So that's another reason that I classified this one in particular, because it does it more than any of my other ones as a ultra finicky, fussy plant. But I'm gonna set her back aside. So the next plant on our list is Boston ferns. And if I'm being honest with you, a lot of ferns kind of behave this way as well, but the Boston fern, tends to seem to be the pickiest and fussiest of the ferns. So that's why I picked that one. But this plant, oh man, I don't even know you guys. It's really hard to stay on top of watering ferns. They just literally, you, you'll think they're still super wet, but they are like, nope, not wet enough. And then whole fronds will like start to dry up, crisp up, die and fall off. And the most annoying thing about it is that it makes the plant look crazy because a nice full flowing fern looks awesome. But when you start losing whole fronds off that fern, then it starts to look a little weird. And for some reason, they seem to take longer to produce new ones back in the place of where those old ones fell off. And so, yeah, you just end up with a weird looking plant. Now this plant is also super picky about lighting. It really wants like super dappled indirect light, but bright dappled indirect light, which that is extremely hard to recreate in your home. So good luck with that one. But if you can get that lighting right and you can get that watering right, they tend to perform okay, but they also seem to want higher humidity as well. And they will do the exact same thing I just described if they aren't happy with the level of humidity in your home. So when you do see that crisping up and leaf loss and everything like that, it could be any number of things. You just have to troubleshoot it. Like, are you sure you didn't go too long without watering it? Are you sure it's not getting too much light and that's causing it to crisp up? If that's not the case, then yeah, maybe it's humidity. But once again, just super fussy and finicky and hard to figure out. And I mean, it takes nothing, you guys. It's like, okay, I wanted water a minute ago. You didn't give it to me. I'm gonna crisp up 
and I'm gonna die. And pretty much if you let this continue to happen, it's kind of like what I was describing with that nerve plant earlier. The more you have this happen, the less likely the plant is to bounce back and eventually the whole thing crisps up and dies. So that's why I put it on this list of super fussy finicky plants. But next on our list is a very, very popular anthurium and that is the queen anthurium. And let me tell you something, you guys, I think you would be hard pressed to find somebody who owns a queen anthurium who doesn't have it living inside of a greenhouse tent or a greenhouse cabinet or a terrarium or something like that. And whenever you see a plant where nobody ever has it living outside of an enclosure like that, that's a real good sign that that is a super fussy, super finicky plant. And this queen anthurium is exactly that. This plant wants super high humidity. That is why most people keep them in greenhouse cabinets or terrariums or grow tents or whatever it may be. Now, don't get me wrong, it is a gorgeous plant, but it is definitely fussy. It does like to have its soil more on the moist side. It doesn't even wanna dry out, I think, as far as the alocasias do. So I don't even think I would go more than a quarter of the pot drying out on a queen anthurium because you're probably gonna start to see some weird leaf crisping up and things like that. But the other problem with these plants are they are just super sensitive about everything. I mean, don't breathe on this plant wrong. Like, I kid you not. If you have a fan in your greenhouse cabinet, which you better, because for this plant, it's gonna want that 80 to 90% humidity. And if you don't want those bacterial or fungal or mold things going on on the leaves, you need airflow but don't put that airflow directly towards that leaf because that's gonna cause a problem. And I mean, don't touch the leaf if you don't have to either because they damage super easily. And then as the leaf grows, it starts out small and expands bigger. So if you accidentally like scar it, that scar just gets bigger as that leaf gets bigger. I mean, it is just so, so finicky. And kind of like with the alocasias, a lot of people run into the problem of a new leaf comes out, the oldest leaf dies. A new leaf comes out, the oldest leaf dies. So they are really difficult to keep happy. They do like bright indirect light. You do have to be careful too when you have them in those cabinets that you're not getting them too close to your grow lights because then you can get leaf burn on them. They are just very, very picky plants and that's why everywhere you see them, they're inside some kind of closed controlled environment. So I don't know, I'd say uh, avoid that definitely if you're a beginner, if you're more experienced and you're up for the challenge go for it because they are gorgeous plants. But speaking of plants that often you see people putting inside of terrariums or greenhouse cabinets, etc., next on our list are Rex begonias. And this is another plant where lots of times the people who are successful with them, it's because they're putting them in some kind of controlled environment like that. Now, there are two different types of begonias. If you're not aware, there is cane-like begonia, there is Rex begonia, there are some hybrids that are kind of well, not kind of, they are a crossbreed between a Rex and a cane, but it's the Rex ones specifically that seem to be the finickiest and fussiest. And they are some beautiful plants, you guys. I know a lot of people don't like begonias, but there are just so many pretty like leaf patterns, some that are like swirled, look like little snails, some that are this beautiful sh shade of like red or pink. I mean, they really are pretty plants, but there's a reason I don't own any. I know they have a reputation for being super fussy, and I honestly like the cane begonias better, a, because they aren't as fussy or as finicky in my experience, and B, I kind of like the look of them a little bit better when they grow tall and get big and everything. But nothing will top the look of some of these leaves on these Rex begonias, and they're great and beautiful to enjoy in your home if you can keep the leaves there, and that is the biggest problem on this plant. When it is unhappy, it will just crisp up a whole leaf, drop it off. If it's still unhappy, it will crisp up another whole leaf, drop it off, and then eventually the whole plant crisps up and dies off. So it really wants higher humidity. That's one of the big reasons that people keep them in those controlled environments. We're talking at least above 60%, but these leaves are a little bit sensitive as well, especially sometimes to moisture. So really gotta make sure that airflow is good in that kind of controlled environment with that higher humidity. Now with lighting, bright, bright, indirect light, be careful about getting them too close to grow lights or in any kind of direct light, they don't really like that. Now, when it comes to watering, these plants definitely like to be kept more on the moist side. And that goes true for all begonias, cane-like begonias as well. These plants don't like to dry out kind of in the slightest, but with the Rex begonias, you go a little bit too long. And once again, the whole leaf will crisp up, fall off. Another one will crisp up and fall off. And if you go even a little bit too long past that, the whole plant can crisp up and die. 
I find the Cambogonias are a little bit more forgiving than that. Maybe the tip of the leaf will get crispy if I go a little bit too long on my Begonia maculata, but it's not just gonna like the whole plant crisp up and die like you will see sometimes with these Rex Begonias if you're not getting that care just right. The other thing is they are very sensitive to temperature. They are some of the plants that I think are most particular about wanting a very warm temperature. They don't like it when you get too low. I think most people that have really good success with them are probably keeping them somewhere around like, you know, 70 to 75, maybe 80 degrees Fahrenheit. But yeah, they are not fans of cold temperatures. They are not fans of cold drafts. And once again, the number one thing they're gonna do is crisp up. And so you're always left with, why are you crisping up? What, what have I done wrong? What's going on? So yes, just super difficult fussy finicky plants, but if you can figure it out, they are quite beautiful. So next up on our list is a flowering plant that is a very beautiful flowering plant, but very super fussy and finicky, and that is African violets. And if you see these in stores, they are always not only in like typically an enclosure, like we've been talking about, like with the begonias or the queen anthurium, but they also have their own specific grow lights in that enclosure because they are notoriously hard to keep blooming and looking pretty. And it is just a super duper controlled environment. And the reason for that is they are just so picky and they like to be kept on that moist side as well, but they are super prone to root rot. So if you even go slightly over, game over, they're rotting, they're dying, they're done. They are also very particular about their humidity. They prefer that higher humidity, but they hate to have wet leaves. Let me repeat that. They love high humidity, but they hate to have wet leaves. What? Like, how are you gonna manage that? This is why they are notorious for being super finicky and super difficult houseplants. But once again, very beautiful if you can master it, but definitely avoid any kind of direct light on them because that will fry them to a crisp. And you guys, you know, one way you know this is a super finicky plant is the fact that they make a soil mix specifically for African violets. I mean, almost any store you go to that sells soil mixes will have a bag that says, African violet soil mix. It's kind of like orchids. Orchids have their own specific soil mix as well. And I almost had orchids on this list, but they are not quite as finicky in my opinion as some of the other plants that were on this list. So that's why they didn't make the list today. But just curious, if you think orchids are finicky, fussy plants, comment down below and let me know. But yeah, once again, they have their own specific soil mix. That's a pretty good sign that they're gonna be fussy and finicky. So once again, African violet's probably not a great house plant for beginners. But our 10th plant that we are gonna look at today, and this will come to no surprise to a lot of you who have been following me for a while, because this one, I have told y'all, it is so weird, it is so finicky, it is so fussy, it is so difficult to figure out, and I have tons of plants in this genus that I have zero problems with except for this one. And that is the watermelon peperomia, which scientifically is a peperomia argirius. You guys, I mean, the things, the things I can say about this plant. So one of the biggest problems with this plant that you're gonna experience is deformed leaves. So if you can see here, there's like some tears in some of these leaves. Some of them are kind of like just misshapen, like curled under, deformed looking, funky. They don't look how they should look at all. If anybody has ever seen one of these that looks good, and I will flash one up on screen for you here, that's what this plant is supposed to look like, not this. And all of my other peperomias that I own, they're doing fine. I don't have these kind of problems with them. It's just this one. And I have tried them in different environments. I've got a propagation of this one in my Ikea greenhouse cabinet. It's not doing the best either. Like it's probably looking a little bit better than this one, but in my experience, so like most peperomias, they are very picky about their watering and they are very prone to root rot. So you have to be really careful. They don't like to dry totally, totally out, but they like to get pretty far dried out and then you gotta hit them with that water again. And if you go even slightly too long, these stems will droop, the leaves will get soft and mushy. And once again, you do that too many times and it just won't come back. It will completely just rot, die, it's gone. But yeah, I, I have tried to troubleshoot this and a lot of people say that it's a nutrient thing, that these plants are very specific and they want lots of calcium. Well, I've bought fertilizers with higher calcium and it has really done nothing to help me out with this plant. Now it does seem to be a little bit picky about lighting. It definitely does not like direct light. It will get brown spots from like burn if it's getting direct light, but it also doesn't really seem to do well in too low of a light situation. So it's kind of like it wants medium indirect light, I think, but it's really hard to find a spot that makes sense in your house for that, that also isn't gonna let this plant be sitting, being too wet in its soil for too long, because once again, then you're potentially gonna have a root rot situation. So just very fussy. 
And I've had some people say that they want higher humidity, but once again, I've put one in my greenhouse cabinet and it's been averaging like 70 to 75% humidity every day and it's not doing anything different in there. So super finicky, super fussy. However, let me set this guy back down real quick. So even though I'm telling you these are super fussy, finicky plants, I'm starting to develop a theory. And that theory is that maybe they're just super fussy and finicky for those of us living in North America, because this picture I'm showing you is actually a guy from Australia and he swears this is one of the easiest plants. And I was like, yeah, right. Nope, nope, you probably bought it like that. No, he swears that he had problems with it in the beginning too. He let it kind of die all the way back. It happened a few times and then it came back stronger than ever. And he just, he calls it a low maintenance plant. Like, you know, he's just like, yeah, it's super easy to care for. And I'm like, uh, -uh. nope, nope. What are you feeding that thing? And then another guy in Australia who is pretty well known posted this picture. I'm starting to think you just gotta live in Australia for this plant to do well, you guys, like for real. Now they do have relatively high humidity in their homes, but they're telling me, you know, it's 60 or above, six, between like 60 and 70. Well, my cabinet is higher than that slightly. You know, it's not so high that it would cause a problem, I think, with them. But yeah, I cannot figure it out. I don't know how they're producing these gorgeous plants. And I mean, this, this is a huge pot, a huge pot of these. So I don't know, something's going on in Australia that we aren't privy to, but until I figure out what that is, this plant is definitely on my fuzziest, finickiest, most difficult houseplant list. So hopefully this video has helped you out today, especially if you were worried about buying a super fussy plant and wanted to know which plants you should avoid if you're a beginner. I hope this information has been useful to you. If so, please be sure to click that like and or subscribe button down below. And if you really want to find yourself a very easy, laid back, unfussy, unfinicky plant, then definitely check out this video next. Thank you so much for joining me today, you guys, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Aloha.